Hey guys, it's Doc Priest and Rod Rodder. Today we're at the Savoy Auto Museum in Cartersville, Georgia. Let's check it out. So Linda Baker designed that. That's the spirit of speed. So that sits out front of the museum. First thing when you walk in is a 1903 curved dash Oldsmobile. Really nice shape. It's cool to be able to see underneath. And there's some oil dripping off there, so these are actually working machines. Next one here, the Ramblin' Wreck Model A from Georgia Tech. This is a replica, but there's actually only one that's considered to be the real Ramblin' Wreck. All the others are considered replicas, even though this is a real Model A. The Black Beast, 1909 Alco, 100 horsepower, 3,300 pound car, four speed transmission. Top speed is 121 miles an hour. Man, I would not want to do 121 miles an hour in that. Very cool. There's another big guy. Check that one out. Let's see what this thing is. Left hand drive. Bucket seats. Look at those big headlights. That is so cool. 1913 Marmon Speedster, 48 horsepower, 182 inch overall length. It's only 2,200 pounds. That is 95 miles an hour. Again, not something I'd want to go that fast in. That's probably it. Gear in there is probably what ran the speedometer. Yep, there's a speedometer gear ran off the front wheel. 1907 American Underslung. This 50 horsepower guy, they call him underslung because the spring is over the the uh, chassis. So there's an underslung frame set up. Let's see if you did that in the back as well. Yeah, you did it in the back as well. It's underslung all around. Look at the grease. Opens where you oil it. Yeah, it's a fun activity for you. It saves you some money. <laughs> somebody must have updated some of this. This is really neat. Look at the speedometer. <laughs> and little droplets of different oils and stuff you'd need over there. All lined up like a little bar for the car. That's very neat. Love the grill emblem and the hood ornament. Coming on over to this one, we got a 1907 Renault. This one's 65 horse. 85 mile an hour top speed. And this one's got the crank holster on it. The other one did not have the holster for it. Which oils and everything there? Starter button. This is perhaps one of the first economy cars for marketed for the United States. It was fully designed and made overseas. It was designed here in America, built overseas and brought in here specifically for the American car market. So it's kind of the first uh, import car targeted for the United States. And it's a, um, it's a uh, Nash Metropolitan. They were, they were a small little car. Uh, they were designed like a second car. The, uh, the wife would drive it to work or to do her errands while the husband was at work. And it is a four-seater very tight one. This one's been upgraded with modern seatbelts. But check out how nice these interiors are. Tight, but kind of kind of neat. You have a uh, um, little tuck and roll interior, a little back seat where your kids could fit. A couple bags of groceries. And they, they were a cool little car, this drop down here. They were designed to be very uh, um, inexpensive to build and easy to do. The kind of, the body panels are fairly interchangeable. Just a neat car. And here's the Chrysler Airflow. This was a car that was way ahead of its time. This was something that, what they did is they did a lot of money testing on this, and these things probably would have been more successful had they come out after the Great Depression. But right in the middle of the Great Depression, they came out with this, and it was a very forward design. Um, when doing wind tunnel testing, they found out that almost every production car at the time was more aerodynamic going backwards. So they kind of shaped the nose of it to kind of look more like the trunk shape of another car and uh, just streamlined it. And they were very conscious of the of the streamlined design of it and how it cut through the air. Made a very efficient car, uh, very uh, well designed. Check out those taillights. Those are really cool. They're integrated into the bumper bracket like that. That's beautiful. Very neat. 
suicide doors on the rear, gray panel on the rear seat, twin glove boxes. That was kind of a, a common thing in the 40s and in, in the late 30s. Crank out individual crank out windshields so both sides could get AC as they wanted it. The Kaiser Darren. This is a very unique car. It has the way the doors open up into the body like that. Another fiberglass body sports car to kind of compete against the Corvette. And this was in 54 when this one came out. Six cylinder, 90 horse, unique little grill. A very expensive car when they were new, $3,650. Very cool though. I remember the same company that did this was the same company that did Henry J's and, and uh, other cars like that. So this was a real outside the box step for that company. Uh, this one always holds a soft spot for me, the 57 Corvette. My dad had one. His was uh, Venetian red with the Sherline beige coves. Always like the waffle pattern interior. Simple design, mirrored dash flat steering wheel. When I was in fifth grade, my dad and I flew out to Salt Lake City, Utah, and I uh, bought one out of a junkyard and drove it home. There's a couple things on this one that aren't correct. The cross flags would have been on fuel injection only. And this was a lot of this, a lot of times the belly button gets erased when they're sanding them to repaint them. This should have a little lip up here to kind of shield that. And that gets erased a lot of times when they restore them. But it's a very pretty car. This one's a four-speed, which means it's probably a later production. Early in 57, they only had either a power glide or a three-speed manual. The uh, four-speed would come out later. I wish the hood was up on this one, but we can see in the picture here, this is a dual-quad uh, 283 car, and it would, this one's a 220 horse. They had them fuel-injected to get 283 horsepower out of them. Very nice cars. Now, if you look at the taillight, 56 and 57 have these taillights here. And whoever did the chrome on this did a beautiful job because it's very hard to get the chrome to lay down in there. And even the factory GM had a hard time doing that. So in 58 to, to 60, they would they capped them with a big red lens. You know, a lot of guys would customize their 57s by putting that newer taillight lens on it. Not all Woodies were wagons. This is the town and country sedan I plaid cloth seats man what a nice dashboard look at the antenna how it comes up up the dash and out to the front you twist it and point it up the wooden rack for the roof look at the size of those hinges for the rear deck town and country this is a nice uh, 36 Chevy coupe with a unique thing added to it. And I'll show you this, it's pretty neat. So it's a five window coupe, but out back, they took the trunk lid off and turned it into a pickup truck. And there's a reason behind this, not, not necessarily because someone said, hey, I want to start an El Camino. You can see this must've been a rumble seat originally, the step there. But this was done as a conversion kit in World War II. For World War II to beat the fuel rations. If you had a truck, you could get more fuel. So a lot of guys would take their cars and turn them into pickup trucks so they could get a little bit more fuel so they could get around better. That's a really neat thing to see in person. I've seen pictures and stuff, but rarely have I, rarely have I seen one in person. It's a nice car overall, too. So that's a fuel ration beater right there. The elegant Lincoln Mark II. These were a very, very elegant car. They didn't make very many of them. Let's see if it tells us how many. 368 cubic inch, 4,825 pounds. This thing's huge. Uh, let's see. I don't see it on there. Oh man, these were nice. These were done at a time when more and more chrome was added to cars all the time and Lincoln took the opposite approach and thinned out all their chrome and went kind of minimalistic and let the car speak for itself. I love that exhaust coming through the bumper and the Continental spare being in the trunk. That was a, a hallmark of, of the Continental and the Mark series for a long, long time. 
beautiful dashboard. Comfortable looking car. I love how these sit. They're just great looking stock. Please refrain from any, making any reference to flux capacitors or 88 miles an hour. Full of old race cars. Let's check out some of the stuff we'll find through here. We got studs and interstates and all this other stuff. We'll check out some cool stuff. Nice pinstriping on that toolbox. Check this one out. This one. Look at that spring perch. <laughs> I don't think this thing's ever been fixed up or restored. Just polished on a little bit. 1912 Packard. Whew. 30 horsepower. All right, on the back of this Packard, has this plaque. It says, Friends of Ancient Road Transportation. Farts. <laughs> well, it's a three-seater, too. <laughs> This car likes their leaf springs, don't they? And coil springs and everything on the back. Look at the gas tank bracket, it's really cool. Extra tires for your touring. Look at a windscreen, literally a screen. <laughs> That's a 1913 Interstate. And then we'll move on over here to this Buick Model 16, 1909. Polished column and everything. Louis Chevrolet was the driver of this one in 1909. The knee action shocks, friction shock with the, the, the electrical spring set up. Wow. Big old stoplight and a backup light. Very well lit. Check out that 13 speedster, the V butt grill. That's really neat. I think color coded canisters must be water, oil, and gas. Mercer is cool too. This is more one of one than the right This is not a one of one. This is the custom color. This one won't ever make it. Now we're into the small car stuff. We got the 58 BMW Isetta. These are like a grasshopper head on wheels. The whole front opens up, swings the steering wheel out of the way, and two people can fit in there, maybe. <laughs> Oh yeah, we got this. We got the Scooter car, eight and a half horsepower, three seat. This one, like I said, is a two seater, but check out how you had it staggered in there. Almost a tiller type steering. If your passenger would sit kind of behind you. A tiny little, what size are those tires? Eight inch rims. <laughs> The door is the size of the whole car. He's a little guy. So small, it only has half a door to open to get in and out of. Again, a two-seater, but this one here side by side, like the Isetta. And Doss. Otto Doss was one of those rare individuals that not only decided that he could build his own car, he actually did it. 1954, he built this little bugger. And this is only nine and a half horsepower. Completely convertible top. Here's a Messerschmitt, 10 horsepower. These are German cars. Looks like they got about an eight inch wheel on too. I always thought these were cool looking, kind of like an airplane. Look how narrow that seat is, jeez. On loan from Lane is this uh, Peel. These are the world's smallest car. This one says it's a replica, but it's a 1964. 10 horsepower, three speed. You could argue it's not really a car because it only has three wheels. So certain areas would classify them as a car. Other places would say it would fall under the motorcycle category. But that's a tiny little bugger. Give you an idea, that 
a two foot long or two foot wide square. So it's little, but this thing, I don't even know what this thing is. But you're not going on dates with this one, that's for sure. I guess if you drove something like this, you wouldn't be cool enough to get a girl anyway. <laughs> Armar from England, seven and a half horsepower, 35 mile an hour top speed. I always like the name of these. This is a Google mobile, <laughs> a Google mobile. 15 horsepower. I mean, German built, if I remember right. Yeah, German. Right hand drive. Oh, look it, it's a four seater. Yeah, right. It's got less room than the back of a new Mustang. All oh, traffic haters up there for directionals. There's another with sliding windows on it. It's kind of neat. No hood. Hmm. An Operman Unicar, 18 horsepower. Interesting. Wonder how you access things. If it's all one complete body like this, it must lift up somehow. The man 1953 Mano car. You can see the engine right inside that grill there. It must be air cooled from France. The PTV, sporty little thing. Whoa. <laughs> Wheels look huge on it. Moshe. Now look at this thing, right? You got all these little guys and also you got <laughs> <boom. And> it's <laughs> 51 Hoffman. This thing's really wide looking. It looks like it got squished. It's German, of course. Six and a half horsepower, 28 miles an hour. It must've been fairly stable. Three, well, I don't know, there's not much underneath the back there. Check that out. That wheel's way under there. Way underneath. This must have been really weird to drive. Look at it from the back. That's kind of cool, man. Look at this thing. That's a pretty nice design. 53 Rove, and it looks like 50s. Check out that emblem, it's really nice. Check out the interior on this one. Two seats. Look at the shift levers there. Interesting. He's even got a cup holder. No, no, it's not a cup holder. That's the door stop. <laughs> Neat steering wheel. And this little guy over here. This one's probably one of the prettiest of the little micro cars that they have here. 1939 New Map Baby. Classy design even with a spare so that woody artwork is made out of Rubus cubes so you got this 70s car display right going on right now that's a Vegas Pintos Gremlins and all that other stuff and we'll see what this one's we got the 71 Vega it's not often you see one left stock. You usually, usually got small blocks in them by now. That's a nice clean car. I always like that roof line. And then his rival, the Pinto. That's the stockest, cleanest Pinto I've ever seen. I don't think they were that nice when they were new. The Chevette, I remember you used to be able to get these things for a few hundred bucks. 76 Chevette. What do you think, hon? What do you think of that interior? <laughs> That's a little runabout. This is the two door. It's my birth year, too. Where, I wonder where they found this in that good of condition. Those things were really good economy cars. They're probably better than the Vega. The Vega's engine was terrible designed with aluminum block with an iron head. The gas mileage doesn't end up 39 miles. Yeah, that'd be nice, huh? Why things clean as a whistle? So Vega stepped up their game with the Cosworth Vega. These were 111 horsepower. They were uh, with the twin cam, took care of the engine problem. Still a really cool roof line and everything on them. The body rot was a big issue on all the Vegas. They were sporty. They came in a only a couple color combinations, black, white, and I think gold. And they all have the, the you know, complimentary color that matched that for the pinstriping and stuff. These things, still got the window sticker and everything on them. 
$6,300. Jeez. Price a little bugger. So it said that when they were trying to design an economy car at AMC to compete with Ford and Chevy, they, the designers took a uh, um, Hornet and literally just cut the back off it. And it certainly looks that way. An awkward looking car for an awkward time. People argue the name was terrible, but now it's just geeky cool. And the only thing geekier and cooler and geeky cool more than a geeky cooler, I guess that's what it would be. Then the Gremlin is the Pacer. Pacer X. Ooh, this one might have an 8 in it. Some of these Pacer Xs actually had... No, this one's still a 258. Look at... These are very wide cars. They, they had a lot of interior room. The Gremlin and the, and the Pacer both. Uh, so these were a very stable car. They handled pretty good for what I heard. I've never driven one. Look at how the door panel comes up over onto the... That's just bizarre. But it's also an AMC. I heard if you got them without AC, you pretty much cook in the summertime with all that glass. And the wagon version actually looks a little better proportioned. They got some really cool artwork here. Some pretty unique stuff. That's pretty. That'd be cool to hang in any house. So this room is fabulous fins. So they faced all the cars backwards. So you can see the fins when you first come in. See so this big old lavender Lincoln Premier. And then come around to the 57 Studebaker Golden Hawk. Studebaker was way ahead of their time. Raymond and Lori designed a lot of their stuff. They had some really neat dash layouts and stuff. Their fit and finish was really good. And they got muscled out by the big three couldn't keep up and some of those came supercharged with a Paxton supercharger and then one of the only ones I have seen in here that's not a restored stock is this 57 Chevy rally wheels over stuffed seat let's see what else he's got for hot rod goodies inside shaved mirror it's a Bel Air car hard top it's got a palace style steering wheel AC has been fitted to it it's a nice little hot rod Oh, it's like Packer Caribbean. Tri-color outside. That's a big car. The car's huge. Spotlight. Look at the spotlight mirrors. That's really cool. Push button automatic on the column. See the stock? That's a very large car. It's tall. Look at it compared to the Chevy next to it, things, man, oh man, it's a big car. A lot of things people forget that, uh, is that uh, Chevy came out with fuel injection 57, but so did Pontiac. And here's a fuel injected Pontiac. This has got to be a really rare car. Being a convertible, same quarter dip that the Chevy's had. Really cool dash layout. Let's check out the fins on this sucker. Look at all that extra chrome in there. Let's see what the horse, 315 horsepower. Four speed automatic. Heavy car, as much as a T-Bird. The Plymouth Fury. This body style was made famous by Christine. This was a 59. One of the fins, the angry headlights. That's the Sport Fury really fit that design of the Christine as being a haunted car. It's nice to see one that's done in the original color instead of just red like the movie car. Beautiful hardtop design. Those fins aren't much smaller than the 59 Caddies. Chevy's first dive into the car truck was a 59 El Camino. 59 and 60, they were based on the full-size car with the X-frame design. And then they would disappear and come back again for 64 based on the A bodies. I was like that curve of the roof and that little, it's like having a baseball hat on backwards. And the cat eye taillights and the laid down fins. It's a very cool looking car. So Cadillac started the fin craze. 
with the 49 and 50 Cadillac. Here's a 1950 four-door. The elegance of a Cadillac. This car probably rides so beautifully. I love those front ends. This one, take one of these in a sedan at me and I'll love them, like Cadzilla. And then that would eventually give way to that beautiful car. Look at that, man oh man. The Eldorado. <clears throat> beautiful grill work and everything. Look at the chrome fender wells. They're probably stainless fender wells. The lean of that windshield. The car looks like it's going fast, sitting still. The comfortable bucket seats, front and rear, padded, everything. <laughs> Look at that steering wheel, it's beautiful. What a car. The Eldorado Barretts. Now this is a four headlight car. When four headlights first came out, they weren't legal in, in a lot of the states. This is a 58 Cadillac. 57 was the first year they started doing quad headlights on some cars. So this is one of five, this this car here. I'm going to show you a couple cool things on this Cadillac. This is really neat. It's a beautiful car. And now I know why he calls it Raindrop. So first off, that's a magic eye right there that picks up and automatically dims your high beams for you, which is cool. you got to remember the year that this was done. But that pad on the back there, that was a rain sensor. So if you park this car out in your driveway at night when you came home and went inside and it started to rain, rain would hit that sensor there and it would automatically put the top up. So all this stuff that we think is new today is not as new as you think. That's just awesome. Man, this is just the coolest car here, hands down, man. This is... They only made five of these. The rain drop humidity sensor was one of the f most fascinating high-tech gadgets Cadillac developed in the 1950s. Upon detecting moisture, the mechanical symphony would be set in motion and was, and this was showcased at the GM Motoramas. The convertible top would automatically close and the windows would roll up. No need to interrupt your shopping trip or golf game because it is in less than one minute your parked vehicle transformed into a fully enclosed coupe. After the show circuit, the rain drop design was scrapped and today it is believed that only two of the original five raindrops survived. Harley Earl's design. Man, oh man. I remember seeing and reading about these. This is so freaking cool. Wow. Of course, you can't talk fins without talking about the 59 Cadillac Eldorado with his monstrous fins. Those are the biggest fins of all the fin cars. And a couple of these hot rod and customized. And the chrome goes up over the cowl and everything. The bullets in the grill. There's the, the largest and tallest of the fins is the 59 Cadillac. And then a short scant couple years later, they toned it down. And got sharper and lower, a little more streamlined looking. So in '60, they got much finer. I mean, they were that looks like it would hurt if you bumped into that. <laughs> I actually like the '60 better than the '59. I think it flows better. The '59 fins get up so high they look like two added in. So there it is, guys. That was the Savoy Auto Museum. Not the biggest museum I've been to, uh, but it had a really cool collection. You know, I should have read more of the stuff. We were kind of in a hurry, so I wasn't able to do the whole thing. But uh, that Vega, Liberty read it, and she filled me in on it. That 71 Vega that was in there, that was the very first Vega off the assembly line. And that Eldorado Brits, that was just awesome. The uh, um, cars that, there's, so there's a few cars here you're not going to see anywhere else. You might see something similar to it, but it's a very neat collection. I like all the pre-war race stuff. I did not have a lot of hot rod stuff, but they, they changed their displays. They have some rolling di displays, so they're going to be doing muscle car stuff, and uh, I believe they have some hot rod stuff lined up. So this is definitely a museum we're going to visit again when they change out some displays. Thanks for watching, and, it, and click that subscribe button if you need it. Thanks.